Hello. We're live. Mo- Nate, we're, we're live on a Monday. Li- live, live. We're here. Hello in person. How you doing, Nate? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I appreciate you doing this with me today. Penn State Pro Day was on Friday. Um, we covered the running, the jumping, the testing, the talking, all the things that happened. Um, but, you know, it is a long day, and we didn't really get a chance to recap all of it here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. Uh, so I wanted, I didn't want to wait until Wednesday when we're already moved on to talk about Penn State football and practice and all the things that we're going to be talking about on Wednesday. So uh, we're doing just a, a quick Monday show here, and Nate has agreed to come on and, and hang out with me and talk about Pro Day. I'm always curious how much Penn State fans care or don't care about players once they've once they're done being Penn State football players like how much do fans care about pro day because I love it I was there the whole time I was there early 8 30 in the morning all the way until like 1 30 um but you know you just you, you never know uh with these things I, w- what's your historic takeaway you've been doing this a lot longer than me uh what's your what's your view of of these type of draft things yeah I, I think there is passing interest Right. I, I don't think it's irrelevant, um, but I, I I certainly don't think it is to the level. Of, right. It's they're Penn State fans. They're not. Caitlin King fans, you know what I mean? Like that's yes. it, that's just kind of this interesting dynamic of, um, you know, the uh, Penn State fans start being fans of a player once he's committed. Right. Verbally mm-hmm. committed to because it's it's let's be honest, it's not as though. Uh, right. Our whole business is built around this, this being invested in a player before he steps on campus. Right. It's it's not, yeah, it's not just once you get to campus. Um, but yeah, no, once, once, once pro pro day happens and, and certainly there's a, there's an interest in the NFL level, right. Once they get to the NFL and And then it's more about, yeah, Yeah. it's more about clout, right. Where you want to have the best players. You want to be proud of guys. You want them to succeed there, but that's, it does always, I think, tie back to you want Penn Staters to be doing well, not necessarily individual people. Yes, right. It's uh, how, how many Penn State fans are, uh, you know, watching intently uh, Jawan Johnson. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a great success story that he is converted to tight He's end. Awesome. Yeah. And been, uh, you know, maybe not a number one option uh, in in New Orleans, but also one of the main options. Um, so on the show today, we're going to talk about what can ha- happen on Pro Day. And you bring up Kalen King, and I, there, is a, yeah. there is a lot to get to there um, in terms of just the, the conversation around Kalen King, what he said on Friday. Uh, but I do want to start with Chop Robinson. We're going to do a little bit of a flip the script here where, where Nate is going to lead the conversation and I'm just going to kind of react to, to what you have in mind. Yeah, well, I was going to correct you earlier um, when you said we watched the running and the jumping and the bench pressing, etc. Uh, I did not. I did not do that. Uh, that is that is not my lane. Um, but you, however, are excellent at it and have a, a good idea of what all these things mean, right? That's, that is, and I, I think that I can speak for many people in saying, yeah, okay, uh, you, you know, you get the, uh, the three cone drill time, right? Like I, I think yeah. you sent the group a, a text last night, you know, wondering why the three cone drill numbers, have have not, right? Uh, need this information. But that's that's the that's the curiosity, right? Is why yeah. why do you need that information? And let's start yeah. with Chop Robinson. What like what is it about uh, what he was able to do that uh, that you think gives you an indication of of what he might be able to do at the next level? So let's let's do some show and tell. Let let's actually show you exactly what this means. Um, you know, because I was out at as you mentioned at Pro Day, putting stuff on the internet, and people were stealing my video and then putting it together with other videos. So now I'm reciprocating that steal. So here is Chop Robinson doing the three cone drill. And a lot of people will say because at the beginning of this, this is about explosiveness, but really this is about bend. This is, and you can see here, Chop Robinson, this all 22 footage of him coming around the corner. This is what he does. So the three cone drill, how fast you run that is how fast you can bend around an edge. And we're going to get to some of these things against Michigan 
And I I can't show this all 22 footage all the time on the YouTube channel, but it's out there in the universe now um, on Twitter. So now I'm going to start using it. And when I told people this year that uh, Chop Robinson basically by himself shut down Michigan's passing attack, that's what I'm talking about, what you just saw there. He physically couldn't be blocked by the right tackle, so they stopped throwing the football. So bend, three-cone drill, it is testing how athletic you are at going around tight corners and cornering uh, through uh, contact if you have, you know, uh, at the combine, they'll do a little bit of that where you're going up against a bag. But here it's just how fast can you turn a corner and it's, you know, kind of like with a car, it's a, it's your, it's your handling. It's how, how well, not just how fast you are, but how well you move. And, um, I, I think he just, abs he did one drill. That's all he did. And he nailed it. Is he posted a pretty good 40 time, I believe, uh, at, yes. at the combine, right. In Indianapolis. Yep. Why is that important for an, an end prospect like him? Uh, right. I think there was some conversation uh, about where he fits at the next level. Right. Uh, that well, there's all if you're 290 pounds as a defensive end, there's always a question about how uh, you fit at the next level because everyone wants deny Dennis Sutton to have chop Robinson's athleticism. Cause then you have miles Garrett. You have one of the best pass rushers in the NFL. Um, so he's 255 pounds. You know, he's, he's six foot three. His arm length is not ideal for the position necessarily, but it's not far off. So he's going to be seen by some people as a tweener who want certain things. He certainly doesn't have every single NFL team is going to want him because of some of these things in his in his film or I guess in his profile but he ran a 448 40 yard dash which is linebacker speed um and then the real number that matters here is the 10 yard split which is how fast you are over the first 10 yards which is what we saw on uh, in pass rushing drills and it was a 154 which was the, I think the best at the combine and I think was second best in the last two years from all edge rushers. So he's got a leap burst. He's got a leap bend. And I asked him the dumb question. You know, sometimes you have to ask the dumb question to get the answer. He said he doesn't listen to mock drafts or any of those things, but he knows who he is as a player. And, and is he a first round pick in his mind? And he answered, you know, to me perfectly with, Absolutely, yes, and here's why. Yeah, I'm a guy who shows up every single day, gives everything I got, and I'm consistent with everything I do. So I got the best get off from the best men, and there's nobody that could, you, know, you can't teach that. That's very natural to me. Yeah, he's got the best get off and the best bend of um, probably any pass rusher other than Micah Parsons. And, and <laughs> Micah wasn't a pass rusher, technically. Like you could say he pass rushed, but um, Chop is special. And just because he doesn't have a lot of sack numbers, there is this conversation. Is he a first round pick? Is he not a first round pick? I, I mean, I know I'm biased because I've watched him and I've watched in depth what he can do. His ability to do the most important thing in football from a defensive end perspective, he is, he's right. He, he's one of the best at it in this class. I don't know the full class. I haven't broken down all their film, but I know he's one of the best I've seen at a position and a factory at Penn state that puts out a lot of these guys that are pretty good. It's uh, it, it's funny to hear him put it in, in terms that can't be quantified, right? I work harder than everybody else. Oh, yeah. okay. What does that mean? Right? Exactly. Right. And Kevin then he turns, said the same thing, but then, he, <laughs> but then he, but then he turns to, I got the best get off. I got the best bend. It's like, well, no, yeah, you can, you can say that. That's something yes. that uh, is quantifiable. You can see that. Uh, right. And so he's got that confidence. It'll be interesting to see what he does. Where, I mean, it's uh, I think we're a month and a half early, but ballpark. Yeah. end around one. I think he's got to be an end around one player because pass rushing is too valuable. The other thing is, I think there's this conversation about um, being raw. And so there's, there's different pass rushing moves you can use and chop is speed to the outside almost all the time. And then when he isn't, he uses that and turns it into power where he'll go threaten the edge and then go through a guy. And he does that pretty well. I wouldn't say he's a dominant speed to power guy, but he does do it pretty well. But I think NFL teams. And when you get into these draft scouting guys, they want to see everything. 
right? And I, I do the same thing with a high school recruit. I'm saying, here's what he's really great at. Here's what it projects to. Here are the things that he doesn't have. And it's just more critical in the NFL draft. So if he doesn't use a, a spin move or he doesn't have strong inside counters or he doesn't have a lot of these different hand fighting moves, you call him raw. And I guess to a certain degree that is true. But if you look at the way he does the moves that he does, he's elite at using those. And, and so you're, you're denying him the right to learn essentially. And like, um, some of the other things as well, like in the run game, block shedding and block shedding and pass rush, they're similar skills. They're different, but they're similar skills if you have to be good with your hands. And I think Chop is great with his hands. So, you know, from that perspective, I don't have any issues with him as a run defender and or a um, as a pass rusher. I mean, he got injured blowing up a screen, a, 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 a counter play, a run play. He will throw his body at the run game and it undersized the 255 pounds. I don't have a problem with him playing in the NFL. Cool. Are we ready for Kalen? Yes. And this is going to, this is, this is an interesting conversation. I, I wrote about this on, on Friday. Um, the conversation around Kalen King has gotten crazy internally, externally broad view of him. He's a good football player, Nate. Like he's not a bad football player. And I think that has gotten lost in this you know, two and a half months of draft conversation and, you know, not having a good year, not having a good 2023. You mentioned earlier, they're Penn State fans, not Kalen King fans. And this is the part that I find super interesting of like, beware when you are a football player, the love you get for playing for a football team is absolutely conditional because rewind a year, everyone loved Kalen King. Right now, there are not a lot of Penn State fans that are caping up for Kalen King saying, hey, you know what? He doesn't run fast, but he's a good football player because opted out of the bowl game. Marvin Harrison Jr. spanked him like he did in 2022. Didn't put up numbers that made you go all giggly and giddy on the internet when you saw the PFF stats. But he's not a bad football player. Like he had a disappointing year compared to 2022. It wasn't up to his standard but I don't think that we can just dismiss what we've seen from him. And that's a lot of what's been happening lately. Yeah. I, I do see some, some Joey Porter parallels uh, in the sense of Joey opted out of the bowl game. Uh, Joey did not have the numbers, right. That Kalen did in, in 2022. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think anybody thought that Joey went too early. I think that maybe Kalen, I think there's some argument there, right? Just how sure. Right? I think that's a fair conversation for sure. I mean, that's that's what's interesting to me is is Kalen didn't have the type of year he wanted to have or that he expected to have or that anybody anticipated that he would have. Um, you know, and but it but it almost felt like it was a foregone conclusion at that point. And and I think he uh, I'm I'm guessing here because I, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said on Friday, but it didn't sound like it was much of a decision for him, right? That he, that he had to to think long and hard about uh, being an early entry into the NFL draft. Yeah, maybe you know, maybe the, maybe there should have been right. I mean, maybe <laughs> the, maybe maybe there's yes. a little bit more uh, because look, there's. There is that question of, and you're again, you're way better at this than I am. But like, there's a question if he if he falls to what three round three, I would go lower at this point. But yeah, and and, and that is that is I guess that's the part that is the fair part of this conversation that you're highlighting is he's made bad decisions for sure. Like these these have not been good decisions, given he didn't have a good year, and I think he knows how fast he is. The NFL values speed at corner. So he's not going to test well. And this is the, this is what I was thinking about listening to him. And I had the clips here, but I don't, I don't think it's like almost a minute long. I don't really want to play it, but there is this sense of, I don't want to call it false confidence, you know, defensive bravado of he's been backed into a corner. Like these things have not gone well for him. And he is still professing confidence in himself, which is the only thing you can do. But when does that level of confidence and the I'm going to the NFL draft get in the way of self-awareness and humility? 
of, I need to get better. I need to do these things to maximize my opportunities because he was both dismissive of the NFL draft prop process saying like the combine and all these things, they don't matter because they're not football, but they do matter because the NFL says they matter. Yeah. Um, and, and it matters to your paycheck too. It matters to where you go in the draft. So these are, these are miscalculations on his part that have put him in this situation. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think we just, there needs to be a conversation of, and he talked about this, he, you know, he did well in the field drills at the combine. He did well in the field drills. He had the best 20 yard shuttle time, which is acceleration and, and explosiveness. So he's, he's a good athlete. He might not have long speed, but he can close quickly. Those things are on film. Like he is going to be a good zone corner. So is he an elite Joey Porter Jr. man to man corner that's going to go in the first round? No, but I still think he's got the building blocks of a starter in the NFL. And, you know, I might be wrong about starter, but he's a guy that's going to be on an NFL roster. Some team is going to see him and they're going to think this is a quality player round four, you know, end of round three, maybe round four. But it is different than the conversation we we're having a year ago. And a lot of the reasons that it's different is what Kalen did over the last uh, 12 months. Yeah. The one thing that that was said to me, you know, and this was probably two years ago, was that his his willing, not willingness, but like enthusiasm to defend the run, it mm -hmm. was unique among corners, right? Yes. That that was that was a separating factor for him. I think that that's that's still there. That's going like that. That is something that you can't for sure. There's no stopwatch on that, right? It is literally just how tough are you and how willing are you yeah. to mix it up in that area of the game? And, and also, uh, you know, the, the 20, 20 yard shuttle time uh, is also like that is the stopwatch on it. That is your trigger downhill, your ability to explode into the run game. You see it and your ability to transition your speed going one way to the other. So yeah. so you're right, though. The willingness to do that is, again, what we're forgetting in this conversation. You don't pay corners to defend the run, though. Yeah. So I guess the complicating thing in his profile is that his best metrics, you know, if you look at the advanced data where he played really well in 2022 was in man coverage. So he's not going to be a man to man guy in, in the NFL. Uh, so then he's got to get better. His zone instincts have to improve, which I think we saw some of the steps back from him were in those areas. So there is a, there is a bit of a tough projection here, but when you, Talk about what you just said, which is absolutely right. His ability to defend the run, come downhill. He's a zone corner. Like we thought early, he might be a man to man guy, but really he's, he's, a, he's the quintessential undersized zone corner. And that still has a place in the NFL. Like there's, there is a value in a guy who can play on the outside and who can with instincts and toughness and the anticipation, the instincts were what really were the difference this last season versus 2022. I, I mean, I think my que my question to you is, is he, is, when you say he's not an, a man-to-man -man guy in the NFL, is that, mm -hmm. is that purely based on the numbers and this past season and not having an ability, right? Like, he, obviously he improved his 40 by 0.1 second plus, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, 4.62 I mean, to a 4.52, yep. Okay, so, so he did better there, right? Can he, can he get that down? further is is there like can i mean it's his so it's his... does he need to is his point and that's kind that's of where right. he that's kind of where he was saying none of this matters so even his even the conversation where he's saying none of this matters teams know my gps speed at the senior bowl i was one of the best the top five fastest he yeah. also was getting cooked in man coverage like right. so there's there's that like he he is not big and long you know, he's not a, he's not six. You don't even, the comparison is always the thief of joy here, right? So he's not Joey Porter Jr. Who is abnormal. He's an right. abnormal corner with the length that he has. Joey Porter Jr.'s length is closer to that of a defensive end. But still, Kalen King is not big. He's not like you and I stand next to him. He is not towering over us. Yeah. Um. So the size factor from a, I've got to guard this guy in man coverage. It's not great and then you throw in yeah maybe he time maybe he's faster gps than he is timed but we've seen a lot of evidence of him in the last 12 months and it's not just it's not just um 
Marvin Harrison Jr., which again is an outlier comparison, but his best opponent all year long ate him alive. So there are some things in his profile of being, he can play man coverage, but he is not a guy that an NFL team is going to draft for a man coverage system and prioritize him because he doesn't have the earmarkers of a guy who's elite at that. That's that's the difference here is it's not just can you do it? Are you an exceptional player or do you have the profile of a guy who can be exceptional? And he doesn't because of those those mitigating factors he can't control. So I guess that's where I've kind of evolved on what I thought he was to what he really is. And uh, I mean, you play more zone than man in the NFL, no matter who you are, even if you're a man coverage team. It's all about the percentages and, and how often you use it. But he's a guy that is going to be better in those situations, I think, than than playing man coverage. This is this is devil's advocate on his behalf and probably an unfair question to you because I'm putting you on the spot. But were there any non Marvin Harrison Jr. matchups that he had this season with future NFL guys? And how did he fare in those? Uh, so Caden Prather is the guy who comes to mind as somebody who's big, fast, physical, and, um, and was good, you know, is good. Um, so I it, think he was 50, like he did better in that one, but he didn't shut down Caden Prather. I was just kind of, gotcha. I was going to go in into PFF and look at some of the data because it can tell you like the specifics of matchups and things I, like that. Well, I was, I, I was just going to say, you know, Marvin's like different, right? I mean, we can yes. we can acknowledge him as, if not the best player in college fo football this season, one of the best co players in college football this season, and certainly unique in terms of how he's been described as a receiver prospect. I mean, people yes. are talking about him being the best receiver prospect in ten. I ten years. my comparisons for him start with Julio Jones. So yeah. I mean, he's six foot four. He can run every route. He's everything you want in an X receiver. Uh, so against Maryland, Kalen King gave up six for six for 69 yards with a long of 28. And that's the part I couldn't remember. So in that game, if you remember from T Frank's film room, Penn State played almost entirely cover two. So he's playing in zone coverage, which the idea is you are rallying and tackling. You're not going to prevent all of the passes. Uh, but then he gave up a 28 yarder to Caden Prather in man coverage. One of the few times they were in man coverage. So yeah, even in those situations, it, it was not great this past year. And you're gotcha. right. Marvin, again, Marvin Harrison jr. Is an outlier. Uh, and that is an area where he had his worst game on the biggest stage. And here's the thing. Like if you're reviewing corners and you're seeing like 15 of them, let's say you're only watching four games, maybe on Kalen King. And you're going to start with Ohio state because you know, you're going to, that guy's yeah, definitely playing in the, the league. Yep. That's the one you're going to see him again for sure. And it didn't go well. So, but anyway, I, I think he's, I think he's a better player than we're giving than, than the downward pressure that's happening, but also it is fair. So it's just, it's an interesting just juxtaposition of his personality, um, how it, I think has been a detriment to him, but also it will eventually be the thing he's makes him good is once he, you know, once his confidence is rewarded and he starts playing better, that's going to be what makes him great. So it is, I, I think it's been, uh, you know, these are the non X's and O's things that definitely play into the X's and O's that I think are fascinating. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's certainly motivated right now. Uh, but I, I do think the dynamic of being positioned to be a late first round draft choice right? Have that fanfare, have that arrival and those expectations of, right? Like the, you're just destined for success. Have those have shifted, right? I oh, mean, it's, it's, yeah. it is going to be, it is, he's going to have to work for it. And I think he's ready to work for it. I think he wants to work for it. I'm actually, it's, I'm, I'm almost changing my mind as we speak that if this is what his skill set is, and this is what, this is who he is, then why wait? Yeah. Right. Would, yeah. would he have, would he have, is there anything he could have done next year? That's realistic <laughs> in your Perception. mind. Yeah. It's per so at a certain point, guys like Kalen King who play a lot and play early and play well, it's all about perception to me when it comes to the NFL draft, could he have um, done better and had all of these things stack up to where maybe he's a second round pick? Yes. 
Um, that and that that goes back to playing better in 2023, which didn't happen. <laughs> so you just it's trying again. In and corner is a volatile position. So there are, I, I think you you make a great point. Cer certain guys are what they are. Uh, after a, a time at Penn State, they're not getting any bigger. They're not getting any stronger. They're not getting any faster. They are good football players, but there's probably development there for Kalen from a mental standpoint to play the game better, to be a more clear picture of a plug and play guy than he is right now, which, like I said, we just worked through what he is at the NFL level here on the show. And I don't know that teams teams might not even agree with me on that, you know, of what he is, because there's certain talk about him being a safety. So that's that's he, the conversation is is not going to uh, may not have changed next year if he had a good year. But the testing numbers are what they are. I don't. I don't were you there when he was asked about playing safety? I was. He did. Uh, I don't remember like what it. he said. That. Yeah, he didn't like it. <laughs> he did not like it. No. That's not surprising. Yeah. So, uh, your guy, Kurt, I think you said had a, had a pretty good, pretty good day on Friday. He, he's had the best off season. So the exact opposite of Kalen King is Curtis Jacobs. Um, and the biggest question for him is, is what is he at the next level and what is he trying to be? Um, and I tried, he's so good at this. Like I've tried to get these questions out of him before, uh, these answers and, and, you know, what is he playing? What does he want to be? What is, what do teams want him to be? And he always just says, like, I can do whatever you want. And here are the facts right now. He jumped to 10-9, which you can see here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel, which would have been the best of all linebackers at the Combine. He had a great um, uh, 40 time at the Combine. His 10-yard split was good. These these numbers, I, I think the maybe his three-cone wasn't great, but it was also kind of close to, to um, Daquan Hardy's. And then you look at his profile, as an athletic coverage linebacker, who's now 243 pounds. And Nate, when I tell you he looks like he ate Curtis Jacobs on his way to the pro day, I'm not kidding. He has put on significant muscle mass um, all throughout his body, but his lower half is so much bigger than it was. And he's maintained good movement skill. So is he trying to play Mike linebacker? Is it like, no matter, like you can play uh, Will, you know, the weak side linebacker position, there are guys who play it at 230 pounds in certain systems. There are guys who play middle linebacker close to that weight. He's 240 something. So this is a decision. Um, and he, he was as explosive. He moved well. Um, and maybe he didn't have the four, four 40 time that he would have had if he would have been 230 pounds, but he's still a good coverage player. So is he a rising draft prospect or is he a guy that doesn't have a position? Because this is, this is what I was chronicling the last two years is he was the ultimate team player and gave up his opportunity to play the will position full time to prove I can be a box linebacker in order to be this field box hybrid player who sometimes got to play in the box, but not all the time. And I think that is the biggest question is, is he a Mike now? Is he trying to be a Mike or is he just trying to be big and be a physical will? And I think that's to me, I'm encouraged by all these things because he's performing in the testing metrics incredibly well for a linebacker. What, what, um, what spot did he have the most success while he was at Penn state? Like if you could, I mean, oh, was it obvious to you? It was obvious. Yeah. He was a better field linebacker than he was in the box. And this is the conversation I've had with people at the blue white illustrated message board. And I guess what I don't know, and, and, you know, maybe I should ask Curtis. And by the way, I'm so relieved that he is now not a Penn state football player. So I can openly root for this guy. He <laughs> is one of the most genuine, uh, introspective, kind people I've met. And I am rooting very hard for him. And it is, I would say like, it is, I am biased towards like, I'm, positively projecting him of learning the position in the NFL where he did he get enough time playing will playing in the box full time to actually get better did he have the opportunity to prove it enough on base downs not on third down not in specialty situations but just enough reps playing in between the guard and tackle to actually show He's a good football player, knowing that he had to split time between the two positions, knowing that he had to be athletic enough to play in the field. So, you know, our understanding of him is there a bunch of untapped potential and upside. And I 
I think there is because he's smart. He is a student of the game and he is athletic. Like there is no question that he's athletic enough to be a plus coverage player. And if he can do it at 240, holy damn, Nate, this is a this is a prototype of an NFL linebacker. And that's what that's the conflict I think he's putting in teams minds right now. So that's a good thing that he's putting. Yes, that that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. That conflict <laughs> is a good thing. Um, and, and because you, you want to, you want to prove that there's upside, even for a guy that's been in, in college for four years, linebacker is a hard position. Yep. It's a position where you have to mature. And I think, you know, from a physical standpoint, he's shown like he can care. He's not. The other thing is he's not a big dude. Like in terms of linebacker, he's not six, three. So he's not Abdul Carter, but he's, you know, as, as we said, like he's, He's a thick dude now, so he's got the power behind it, but does he have the position and what are his instincts in the box? Because it wasn't great. Like, you know, if he was an elite box defender, Abdul would have had to wait his turn or found a way to do something different. But yeah. Curtis wasn't, wasn't playing to the highest level possible at that position to prevent that from happening in 2022. And he was also better, <laughs> you know, uh, in the field. And he's done enough to show that versatility of being able to cover on third down, never coming off the field once he was able to, you know, play in the box a little bit more. And that versatility and intelligence um, to also rush. I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's a, a, a perfect blitzer, but he's shown he can be productive there, especially in an ecosystem with a lot of good rushers. So like he's, he's shown all the things he needs to do in spurts, but it is about that. Is there an untapped potential of giving him a just a dedicated? You're going to play whichever box linebacker position it is. That's who we're going to be, and you're going to cut. You're you're going to be a coverage player who has plus run ability, even if he isn't 240. You know, if he he drops some of the weight um, out of the combine time to play at a more natural weight of 235, that's still big enough to play in the NFL. Yep. Uh, Olu or Keaton? Who's next? Uh, let's say Keaton for later, uh, just okay. because I think people want to talk about Olu as a top 15 pick, which there is a comparison here between Kalen King and Olu Fashinu, believe it or not, in terms of sliding in the draft. We should, we should, uh, housekeeping just because I didn't ask, uh, do you have a, a Curtis projection? Oh yeah. I mean, I want to say day two. I want to say, you know, and I think that is a positive projection based on what he's done this off season linebacker. If you're not a first round kind of like all the non priority positions of defensive end quarterback, offensive line, rare, more rare positions that need a complete profile at the position. So offensive linemen, it's, it's much harder to hide guys that aren't good at both things, run and pass. You can put linebackers in the game and take them out based on their skill set. But if you can do everything, you know, you're and you're an elite athlete, you're then a first round pick. And if it again, it's a positive projection. Brandon Smith was a positive projection that didn't work out. Curtis Jacobs is fundamentally a better football player. He doesn't he's not six, four, but he has shown enough of these athletic things that I think he can be a day two pick end of the third round. Maybe. I mean, Navarro Bowman was only six, one. And I know that Navarro Bowman was a very different football player. And, and I'm going to get crucified for comparing the two, but nobody thought Navarro Bowman was going to be one of the best linebackers in football because he didn't go in the first round. And then suddenly in San Francisco before his injuries, he was next to Patrick Willis and an equal. Um, I don't know that Curtis is that, but I think the positive projection of middle round linebacker that can go be a, a starter in the NFL, that's what I want for him. So I'm going to manifest that, you know, but cool. if he goes in round four or five, I wouldn't be shocked either. Okay. All right. Uh, Olu, what do you, what do you, uh, what were your impressions of, of, I mean, he didn't really do anything. On, yeah. Uh, right he did now. the field. <laughs> he did the field testing drill. So he did, he, okay. he pulled a quad or a hamstring. I figured which what it was at the combine. Cause there were so many guys at the tackle position that were pulling hammies and quads um, from the offensive tackle when they were running the 40. So he didn't do any of the testing drills. So we don't have any of the metrics on him, but this is the, this is the um, currency that he has gotten from elite play for two years that he doesn't have to do those things like Kalen King does to right. prove anything. 
Um, also, it helps that he's a prototype of the position six foot six with gargantuan arms and perfect for any anything you want him to do. He can fit into that in the NFL. But there is this conversation about him being a not as good of a run blocker and um, did a whole 40 minute video you can check out with Landon Tangwall over at bluewhiteillustrated.com breaking down where he is good at as, as a run blocker and some of the misconceptions about pad level things that I learned for the first time watching Landon break it down. But really the thing I found interesting was the reaction to Olu. So the DBs are going through their drills, doing the testing drills and, and maybe guys are watching the testing drills and maybe they're not. Everybody watched Olu do his field testing drills. Every single scout gave their full attention to what he was doing. And then after he was done, I saw a couple leave. So that should tell you what people think about Olu Fashinu and what they were there for. And I think that, you know, he's a, he's a dude who's, who's the perception of his slide is incorrect as opposed to Kalen King and the real conversation we had about what he's done in this post uh, playing career world. I think, um, I think it was Caden Wallace. Uh, somebody asked him, you know, how often Olu came up with right during that process interviews. of interviews. Right. Yeah. And it was like all the time, every, yeah. every team, every single team <laughs> wants to know about Olu. They want to know yep. everything, everything they think, uh, possibly can. And, with good reason, right? I mean, if, if you're spending a first round choice and very clearly teams are going to do that, right? A team will spend a first round choice on him. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you want to have, you want to have all that information. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, this was said to me, uh, T Frank. And I couldn't, um, it doesn't matter. It comes from the NFL, put it that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the comment made to me was that he's thin in the chest. <laughs> i i don't is that a I, bad thing like, i don't know I, I, I don't i i i mean look I, I see yolu and i see like the biggest human that i've ever seen in my life um mm -hmm. right i mean he just he's just a massive huge individual yeah um i'm just i'm just curious if that's if that's something that you, you've also noticed and if that's if that's a detraction uh for him I wouldn't say that my analysis on linemen goes that deep because here's a couple of things I'm looking for. What's your lower body look like? Uh, because that's where you generate power. Like whatever you want to say about your, your upper body. Oh, Landon went, went on and on uh, in a good way about grip strength and raving about Olu's grip strength. So upper body strength is important. Like full body, like you got to have the, the complete package. Um, but I don't necessarily love top heavy offensive linemen. Like if he's a little light up top, but he's got long arms, he's filled out correctly. He's, he's not like his posterior chain. Isn't, uh, like he doesn't have a flat, butt. I, he, I look at him and I see a guy that's got all the things, the thing that I learned from Landon, but I always had a concern with is he has horse legs. So he is very tall at the hips and his, his center of gravity is a little bit higher than some of these other guys who can get really low. But then I saw him, you know, he's worked with Duke Mannyweather and his pad level, I thought looked great. Um, something he doesn't do a whole lot at Penn State. He wasn't in a three-point stance. He looked natural in a three-point stance, which is, I think, what, what teams were wondering. Like, can he get down into a three-point stance and can he have that same athleticism coming out of that? Even though, like, in the NFL, Trent Williams is one of the best run blockers in the NFL, and he's in a two-point stance, like, his whole career. Like that, the, It's all about how you create the leverage and strength, and he's good at creating leverage and power and neutralizing somebody else's strength. So I don't really, I don't think, I, I'm i sure everyone wants everything to be great. You're yeah, nitpicking right. every single thing. He's not Orlando Pace, but he is really good. All right. Uh, so, obviously first round projection on him. And then Keaton Ellis, yeah. last guy that uh, made a, I, I think you said on Friday, he won the day, right? He was the, yes. he was the big winner for Penn state uh, coming out of Friday's pro day. Why? Well, he's the one that did everything. Um, and it was just interesting. The first thing I'll start with is, so I don't know if it's a sports psychology thing or what, but you could feel the tension. You could feel the weight every single time he did a drill. 
He had the longest wind up for his 40, for his his pro agility, for his three cone. Like he got himself into his stance. He readjusted a couple times. He stopped and got himself back up and then got back in. But it worked. He jumped 39 inches. And this it was important because he's the guy that had the opportunity that didn't get invited to the combine to show he was athletic enough. He ran a 4 4 3, which is great for safety. He's corner sized, which is the problem. He's 5'11, 185. Like, you know, his move to safety was more about the room necessarily than his right. skills because he's fast enough and he's corner sized. But Penn State's corners were just better overall and the problem was like also the safeties were as well but his pro agility was okay um his three cone i thought was good but he was fast enough he jumped he showed the explosive metrics that he is a guy you can consider for your roster i think jonathan sutherland is a great example here of a guy who's gonna have to make his career on special teams but if he's gonna make his career on special teams you've got to be fast and explosive you got to be one of the better athletes on the team to make that happen because special teams is tough so I thought he did that. I thought he showed he's got the athleticism necessary. And the reason he was passed was because Penn State's got some really good corners and safeties. And, um, you know, that's that's the, the lane. It's a narrow thing. He's got a thread. But that's I thought he did a good job of that. I don't know that it made him draftable, but I do think that it made him a guy that teams are going to think of when they're trying to fill out their practice squad. He 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 also and and obviously we spoke to him after his workout. Um not, not that I would say this, or not that I wouldn't say this, right? About most Penn State players, right? Because most of the guys in the in the program are exceedingly well mannered, good character, right? Just like good dudes. Uh, but Keaton kind of even stands apart among that, right? I mean, he he yes. was a captain for a reason. He's yep. he's got uh, he's got all of those inten- intangibles that. Right. I mean, you Jonathan Sutherland DNA right there, right? right? That's exactly how you would describe Jonathan Sutherland, a guy who put the team first, was a team captain, has the athleticism, didn't have the production, but is a guy that you want to have building the fabric and the glue of your team. Yeah. I, my biggest question is, is Keaton big enough? You know, what's his position? Is he big enough? Because if you're going to be on the roster, theoretically, you have to play somewhere on defense. Like they can't yeah. just have a special teams only uh, roster spot for him, and he's not Sutherland where he's 200 plus pounds. He is built like a corner, but he hasn't played corner since he was a freshman. If he needs, um, uh, if he needs tips for putting on 15 pounds, I'm his guy. <laughs> um, so the last we got a question from the Lions Den that I was interested in, and I I knew you know is going to be a part of this conversation. Um, we are eight two eight six says, do you think that there were GMs and scouts there to see Aller up close and to see him throw being a year out? Nate, what do you think? Uh, yeah, probably it's an added benefit, right? But yeah. if you're scouting a quarterback a year out, not knowing if he's coming out or not, you're wasting your time. Like it, it you, you want to have an awareness. You want to, maybe you want to see him up close as a curiosity, just file it away for later, but you're not going to state college right? with all the problems that it entails to get here from flights from Seattle to just look at Drew Aller throw on air. Like that's not worth it. You can go to a game next fall and do that and do that more efficiently than just being there, but it is an added bonus and it's why Drew threw. Yeah. It's exactly why he was there and why he was doing that. I, I mean, there's a, there's a reality here that uh, Penn State is among the programs where if you're putting 12, 14 guys into the league, right? So once you throw in the undrafted free agents out yep. of this pool of guys, right? Like you're coming, right? Like you're, you're going to come to Penn State. You're going to see, you're, you're going to have personnel at Penn yep. State for pro day, just bottom line. And I, yeah. I do think, I mean, there were 32 teams, right? Every team was represented at Penn State's Pro Day. So, yeah, it, like, um, there's definitely an awareness. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's not, um, I don't think that that's not real. But, yeah, you're, you, it's nice to see him as he's doing these things, uh, you know, ahead of time, right? And, yeah. and that's a, that's a games too, right? That's, uh, you, you, you yeah. want to see yeah, everything. Yeah. You want to see everybody that's out there. Uh, but yeah, Drew was Drew was one of those guys uh, tossing the football on uh, on Friday afternoon. 
I thought it was interesting. Um, Drew and I, the problem is I was not there for the full passing portion because I was talking to some of the players that were off to the side. They were doing those things simultaneously. So it was hard to be everywhere all at once. But what I did see was that Drew was throwing to Theo and Bo was throwing to Trey Potts. And uh, I think Deshaun Hamilton might've been going between the two of them. But when I saw him, he was catching passes from Drew. So there was a bit of uh, my guy, your guy in who they were comfortable with between the two starting quarterbacks of guys that were on the roster previously. So that was, that was an interesting wrinkle, but that that's all I got uh, from pro day. <laughs> Only uh, 45 minutes. Only 45 minutes. But, uh, just one, one note, just cause you said uh, Deshaun, uh, obviously he got hurt. Uh, I, I think yeah, on, on Friday, what, you don't know, right? He wasn't able to come back, right? That was no, no, he, he wasn't able to come back. I, I was trying to keep an eye on it, but of course, like on the show Other moves stuff. on, you yeah, know, yeah. so uh, with, they did pause briefly and then Theo was running a crossing route. So, um, yeah. he, the last I saw, he was in the, he was across the field. There were family and I think some donors and things like that and other people that were invited to pro day on the opposite side from the media. He was sitting in those bleachers and I saw him taking off his cleats. That was the last I saw of him. And that, gotcha. that sucks because there's a guy who has been working his butt off to get back from injuries in the NFL. And the yeah. reason he was at pro day was to show the NFL teams. Hey, you know, you're here to see those guys. You can sign me right now. I'm available. Yeah, yeah. And yep. then he gets injured, which just is, is terrible. Cause again, talk about great dudes and guys with, with a great head on their shoulders and yep. who you root for Deshaun, you know, he had NFL skills. I don't know that he was a starter, but he was a guy that could hang in the league and he's just, it's been tough for him with injuries. And that's, that's always the worst is when that opportunity is taken away from you in those ways. And to have it happen at pro day is just like, that felt like an insult and that yep. felt unfair for, for Deshaun. Yeah. Well, we're not going to end it on that, are we? Give me something uh, positive. <laughs> like the video. There, there yeah, let's look ahead. We've got a bunch of stuff coming up this week. James Franklin talks on Tuesday. That is tomorrow if you're watching this Monday, if you're watching it live. Um, we've got a lot of great stuff to talk about this week. We're talking about the defensive formations coming up tomorrow on the KSN show. And then, of course, Nate and I will be back to recap practice on Wednesday. So after that brief interlude of NFL football and talk, we're getting back to spring football, which is a great reason to subscribe, Nate, to Blue White Illustrated and BlueWhiteIllustrated.com and here on the YouTube channel. Tell them about the special deal. Two months, $1. Use code PSU1 and you will get all I, I, I mean, honestly, uh, I I hate selling. I'm not a seller, but we've uh, we've got a great community and we've got great things going on at Blue White Illustrated right now. We've got tons of spring practice coverage coinciding with NFL draft coverage, coinciding with recruiting, right? I mean, this, yeah. this past weekend was a huge weekend for recruiting. Ryan Snyder, Sean Fitz, have you covered for all of that? I've got you covered for football. Fitz has you covered for football. T. Frank has you covered for football. Greg has you covered for football and wrestling. You name it. It's all there. If you're a Penn State fan, you are absolutely missing out, not checking us out at least, right? Yeah. Two months, $1, gets you through the blue-white game. Check us out. And I always say, Nate, it's not selling if you believe in it. And I, I believe in what we're doing. And that's the great thing is if you want to subscribe to Blue Light Illustrated here on YouTube, that's absolutely free. If you want to advertise with us, that's not free. But I also believe that we can reach thousands and millions of people to help you out. That'll do it for today. That was gross. 